Hey Brooklyn, how you doing? <laughs> so happy to see you all. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Welcome to Target First Saturdays at the Brooklyn Museum with sponsorship by Adidas. Thank you for choosing to spend your Saturday evening with us. We are so grateful as we celebrate Women's History Month and black women in general, all the time, right? <laughs> As you may know, we're also celebrating our special exhibition, David Bowie Is, and I hope that you will take the time to visit over the next few months. Uh, and, and those of you who are not members, I encourage you to become members of the Brooklyn Museum and this incredible institution because we have tons of amazing programming all year long, and membership will get you advance notice about exhibitions and also programs such as this. So we hope that you will become a member. My name is Alicia LaVon Boone, and I, in addition to being Associate Curator of Public Programs here at the Brooklyn Museum, I am a mother, a wife, a sister, a granddaughter, an auntie, mentor, sister friend, and a proud black woman. So thank you. Thank you. Tonight we have partnered with our friends at Simon & Schuster and we're so grateful to be kicking off this relationship with them to celebrate the launch of Beverly Bond's new book, Black Girls Rock, Owning Our Magic, Rocking Our Truth. And we can all get down with that, right? Always, always. And this book is a celebration of black women's voices and stories. Uh, this book thoughtfully pairs essays and affirmations with, from Beverly herself, and she interviewed over, I think, 60 or 70 people uh, all throughout the country and was able to transcribe all of those interviews into first-person narratives. So thank you to her for being able to do all that work and do that. And the folks that are featured in the book are the likes of Michelle Obama, Angela Davis, Misty Copeland, and Mary J. Blige, just to name a few. So please, please, please support her and pick up the book. We're going to have it for sale down in our museum shop. It's $30, super affordable, and she'll be signing books directly after this uh, talk tonight. So in the spirit and format of this new book, we have brought together Beverly and two, maybe three, powerhouse change makers. One's a surprise special guest, so please wait out for that. Uh, and directly following the conversation, like I said, we're going to be down in the museum shop and she will be signing books. So please, please, please continue to support her and Simon & Schuster. So without further ado, I'm happy to introduce you to Beverly Bond. <laughs> Beverly is a women's empowerment leader, entrepreneur, mentor, philanthropist, celebrity DJ, cultural curator, and social innovator amongst many other things. In 2006, Beverly uh, cre created and curated Black Girls Rock, and as, as well as the Black Girls Rock Awards, which we all have so come to love and support over the years. Uh, and she uh, is a businesswoman and community leader and has earned prestigious awards and accolades from Ebony as uh, the Power 100, as well as the most influential blacks uh, in America and two Gracie Awards and the NAACP Image Awards and beyond. So there's like so many ways that we have celebrated her. We're gonna continue to do so. Thank you. In addition to Beverly, we have Michaela Angela Davis, who's an old friend of the Brooklyn Museum. Michaela is an image activist, writer, creative director, cultural commentator, and creator of Mad Free. We have had her on the stage many times here before and love to support Michaela. She's amazing. Uh, she writes and speaks widely about gender, race, fashion, culture, beauty, and identity, and has uh, spoken widely on ABC, MSNBC, BBC, and CNN. And she's been honored as well through the NAACP and the City of New York for her work. Uh, it, shaping and, and misrepresenting properly the narratives of women of color within mainstream media, which is extremely important. So, please come on. I love you, I love you, I love you so much. I love you, thank you so much for being here. Um, and I just want to mention too that she's working on a new project called The Hair Tales which is going to be basically like the, uh, the vagina monologues, but for black hair. That's how it's good. <laughs> So please, I just wanted to plug that as well. <laughs> and lastly, but not least, we have Dawn Davis, who's here in, in, in place of Unique, 
Um, I'm sorry that Unique was not able to make it. Uh, sadly, Unique Jones Gibson was uh, caught up in the snow last night. She was not able to make her trip. Uh, so Dawn Davis has stepped in as moderator for this evening. She's VP and publisher of 37 Inc., an imprint within Atria Publ Publishing Group, which is a part of Simon & Schuster. Uh, she has over 20 years of experience in the business, and she's published several New York Times bestsellers, such as Kevin Hart's I Can't Make This Up, as well as Issa Rae's Misadventures of an Awkward Black Girl, which I know we love. So without further ado, I don't want to take up any more of our time, but I want to turn it over to these beautiful, brilliant black women, and let's dig into the conversation together, y'all. Thank you so much for coming tonight. That's Beverly's payback, because I made her work so hard on this book, but you're going to love it. It is so affirming and uplifting, and I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, the book is titled... Black Girls Rock, and there's a lot of black girl magic in the book. I want to just read a couple of uh, passages. Danny sa Guerrero says, Black girls, we will make a way, and we will continue to do as our foremothers did before us, and it will be against all the odds, but it will be. And to me, that is magical. And throughout the book, there are different uh, expressions of what is black girl magic. I'm interested to know, for both of you, what is, how do you define black girls magic? Um, I think that our magic is just our authenticity and our truth. Um, I think that we have been hiding it, and I think that we have been suppressing it. And I think that now we're starting to see ourselves um, allowing it to happen in the world. And it's all the things that, that we are doing to affirm ourselves. It is all of the, the, the spirituality, um, the connectedness, the sisterhood that we have, the appreciation of who we are, the appreciation of our ancestors, our history, our, our connection with the universe. I think all of that is part of our magic. I think that, you know, that's our magic, right? That's black girl magic. And I think that what has happened is society has, has put a stop sign up and told us that we were not worthy as everyone else. And that's been going on for so long that we didn't recognize it for a long time, and I think we're starting to see it now emerge in ways that we haven't seen before. So it's a beautiful, you know, it's a beautiful thing that we're sharing together. We're owning our glow, as Latham says. <laughs> Michaela, how do you how do you define black girl magic? This, you, like, look around, look around at all the beautiful, like, black, diverse, exquisite. Faces, curls, curves, lips, colors, but <clears throat> and you know, and 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 the magic is big enough to hold all of this. But but really, um, this is my comrade. Like I'm not I'm not just a contributor in this book. Um, Beverly Bond is my day one running dog in heels and 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 <laughs> um and, and i say this because um you know she's got on a sparkly dress her hair is banging most of the time you all see her it's in television and there's lights and camera and action and we live across the street from each other and when black girls rock first started Bev was in the trenches every single Saturday with a bunch of girls. We would have them, you know, staying in our loft, sleeping on our floor, doing whatever, building them up. So this is, um, this is a manifestation of, of a magic seen by her before others called it that. And so I just want to, like, level set um, what this moment is and what what is happening in between these two covers, right? A book, there's something really significant about the object of a book, right? It makes it so it is held in time, it is held in the Library of Congress, it, it, it defines that we were here and this happened and all these women together are bound by something. There is something that puts Michelle Obama and Beverly and Lovey and me and Tamika together and all of us. And that is that, that inexplicable, like that mojo. Like if you, if you can explain black girl magic, you probably don't have it. 
Do you know what I'm saying? Because this, this isn't something that happens in academic, scholarly, you know, this isn't a black academic, you know, like we're gonna like deconstruct black girl magic. I think it's something different for everyone, right? I think, it, I think it means different things. I'll read another passage, Misty Copeland. Have any of you had the pleasure of seeing that woman dance? Yeah. It is magic, right? She says, I press forward to achieve excellence, not just for myself, but for all the brown girls who preceded me and for all of those who will inevitably follow. I rock because I'm creating a, do, a new definition of what it means to be a ballerina. I think it is different for every single body. You not only do the Glamorous Award Show, um, but you talked about these girls that you have sleeping in your loft. You mentor young girls. Tell us how you do that and how you even came up with the concept of Black Girls Rock. I think it started as a t-shirt. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, I had an idea for a t-shirt and I thought it was going to be cool and it was going to make me a lot of money. Black Girls Rock, right? But my first idea was to name all of the women on this t-shirt who rocked, all the black women who rocked in, throughout time. And as I was writing down the names, I kept running out of paper and it was almost as if I was in a trance, right? So I'm writing and I'm writing and I'm writing and I'm, I'm talking. Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, Shirley Chisholm, uh, Marion Wright Edelman, Beyonce. Um, you know, it just was going on and on. You know, Cicely Tyson, uh, Ruby D. I just was just writing and writing and writing and writing and thinking of all of these women who have contributed to society and looking at those names, and I immediately realized that this was a bigger thing than just my t-shirt idea, although I still did my t-shirts. Um, <laughs> but it was, it was a bigger thing. I was like, wow, this is, I'm looking at these women and I'm thinking, how come our young girls don't know who these women are or what they have put in the world? Like, they don't, our contributions are diminished or are pushed in the margins, and it was, it was, as if, it was as, if, as if they were talking to me, right? Because I'm like, this needs to, we need to be celebrated. We need to be, we need to elevate ourselves. We need to elevate our stories. And I recognized in that moment that this was bigger than me. And it was something that needed to be shared because I knew that this affirmation did not happen in my lifetime before that. And it didn't happen for my grandmother and it did, wasn't happening for our little girls. And at the time in 2006, when I started Black Girls Rock, um, for those of you who remember what, the, what it was like for us then, um, that wasn't that long ago, right? But it was, um, you know, we were either dismissed, we were just not seen, we were an, an afterthought, we were backseated, we were objectified, we were dehumanized, uh, we were made fun of, we were the joke. Um, it was never this multi-layered, interesting, diverse, story for black girls. It was always a thing. It was, you know, we were extremely stereotyped. And it was always, you know, whenever we showed up, especially in media and entertainment, where which my career was in, um, it was always the same story. And I kept thinking, like, how is this, you know, I can navigate this as a grown woman, you know, and a grown woman who's been in the modeling industry and seen, you know, but just seeing, you know, these kinds of things, seeing, you know, agents or, or, or um, casting people tell you they've got their black girl you know, um, seeing no pictures of us in magazines, being told that we, we will never make covers, having, you know, the one or two, you know, persons that, that represent all of us, you know, <laughs> for, for our images, um, and just, just seeing that and not anything else. I just knew that, you know, that this wasn't enough. You know what I mean? That this wasn't enough, and so I was just like, this, this is not our story. This was not the story that I know of you. This is not the story I know of my mother. This is not the story that I know of our, our, all of the women that were in my life. And I think that, and we talked about this earlier, I think what really um, kind of sparked a sisterhood thing in me is when I started DJing. And when I started DJing, I was really introverted and super, people that know me know that I never spoke on the microphone at all, period. Like, I would, like if they wanted to tow somebody's car <laughs> and they asked me to tell the people, to move their car, it wasn't gonna happen, right? That's how, I was like, I'm not getting on the microphone, I was just gonna DJ and that, that was my thing, right? But what I noticed is that the way I played, the way I took my craft seriously, um, the way I represented women in the space, there were all of these women, all these black women that were so supportive of me, that didn't know me, but loved the fact that I represented women well. And so I think that sparked something in me 
to, to realize that we have this connection, but people aren't talking about that. People don't talk about, they, they talk about us, they separate us, and they act like we don't connect to each other. And I knew that that wasn't my truth, and I knew that wasn't our truth. And so I just felt like Black Girls Rock was an answer, you know? And then I just immediately um, started just putting the spotlight on this thing I was doing. So whenever people would want to interview me about my fabulous life as a model DJ, I would be like, well, I'm doing this other thing. You know, and are you interested in that? And so I just started just switching that spotlight on Black Girls Rock, and you know, immediately, you know, I got so much attention. I called Michaela. I was like, "Look, I'm doing this thing. <laughs> I need your help." And she was on board from day one. There were so many women that were, you know, I, I didn't build this alone because there were so many women that came on board. By the time we did this, the award show in 2007, the, the, the first award show was in 2006, and we honored MC Light and Jazzy Joyce because the, the DJ has to have an award, um, and by 2007, we were already at Lincoln Center, and it was a, I remember it was a collective group of us, and I remember we called Susan Taylor, who happens to be in the book, and I wanted her to be honored, right? And so I was like, we can get Susan Taylor. Susan Taylor called Michaela, and she was like, what do you guys need? You want me to, like, pass out flyers? Put up some, you know? <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, so I dropped the phone with Michaela. I saw the email, and I dropped the phone, and I ran over to Michaela, and I said, is she serious? I said, she doesn't understand that we, and I called her and I said, you know, thank you for offering to hand out the flyers and be our street team, but we, you know, we want to honor you, you know, and it was just, and it was that simple, and then, you know, as we built it, you know, that year, I remember Kerry Washington calling, like, why am I not a part of this, you know, this was 2007, this was before TV, you know, Regina and Gabrielle Union were our hosts then, you know, we had, we had just so much support because everyone recognized that this message was so important to us, and then from there it grew, and then by 2010, we were already a thing, and, you know, networks were at our door. I think it's interesting that we're at a space now where black women in the entertainment business can support each other. There's a, a how many of you guys remember Daughters of the Dust, that beautiful movie, <laughs> right? So after that, we were blown away and we thought there'd be more from Julie Dash, who is the film's creator. It was so beautiful, it critically acclaimed, and yet there was this, almost this silence. She was trying, but she talked about how difficult Hollywood was. And I'll, just read a little bit. She says, I've encountered people who, after they've heard my pitch, will propose something back to me other than my story. They want me to be the engine that drives their story about black lives, black women, or black families. Stories that have nothing to do with my reality. And she talked about how sometimes even the lone black person in the pitch meeting couldn't really advocate for her, whether they were scared to or didn't have the power to. But it seems like we're at this moment in Hollywood where you have, you know, Ava DuVernay saying, I'm going to do... Queen Sugar, and I'm going to bring other black women directors on. We have Issa Rae, who's creating shows and uh, adopting books from other black writers. It seems like we're in this point where the sisterhood is working. Can you talk to that a little bit, either of you? Do you, do you witness that? Is, am I dreaming, or is? No, and I think that we, we are, we're just in a space where we're being given permission to do it. You know, I don't think that, like I said, my experience from just being a DJ and these half these women didn't know me, but the support was there, the sisterhood was there. Um, so I think that now we're in a space where we see, we're seeing examples of it. We're seeing examples of it when you watch Black Girls Rock. And I remember the reaction when it went to TV. I remember, we already knew it because we saw it happen. But when, when it went to TV, that, way, that reaction was like, it, 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 it turned a switch on with some people that, we can actually do this together. We can celebrate ourselves. We can celebrate each other. And I think that, you know, that feeling has always been there for us. It's just that there have been limitations for us to exist in, and there have been uh, societal messages and also uh, people putting stop signs and saying that there can't be any more of you. You know? Well, I, I think you said we've been given permission, but also we have supported these artists at the box office. We've supported these author authors, uh, artists, whether they're buying Beverly's book tonight as support, <laughs> going to the movies this weekend, uh, tuning in to Issa Rae, tuning in to Blacks, that is also kind of a means of support as well. Absolutely, and that's what I mean, but if you bring our, you have to bring our narratives to the forefront in order for people to even see it, to even know that we exist, and so I think that that's what's happening now, and I love what Ava, uh, and Issa, and Melina, Shonda. and Nzinga, and Shonda, who happen to all be in this book, right. um, <laughs> <laughs> and Julie, yeah. um, I, I just love what they're doing, and Deny, I mean, it's just incredible, you I know. Mean, the incredible thing is we couldn't even if we included everyone, the book would have been 500 pages and $80, so we couldn't do that, right? There were just so many creators. 
Uh, yeah. She's in volume two. She's like two. Volume well, two. yeah, because I see some people in the audience that I've got in volume two already. Yeah. I want to uh, talk. <laughs> Can I speak to that? <clears throat> um, we have, black women have a legacy of doing the work. We, this country was built on our labor, right? So we have, we have traditionally, historically, spiritually carried mm -hmm. this country. This is the difference, right? Like now we get to squat up right. and show each other that we're squatting up because you know you go on Instagram and yeah. you see Ava going, Michelle and Deggio Cello is my musical director. Here's her picture. You know, so we're using our platforms and elevating each other. So this isn't this ain't new to us. Right. We've right. always known that together that we're stronger. What is new is that we have a pathway into media and that was really you know when i when i first heard beverly say black girls rock it was like a mantra it was like how when i was little and you would hear james brown you know say it loud i'm black and i'm brown and we would say it and you would just something your your composition would change right like you right. would or like when you you know the ads from um black is beautiful and i feel like we hadn't heard or felt an organizing system around us since Black is Beautiful, Black Girls Rock did that for this generation. But the, the point is we keep doing that. And like now, this idea of bringing, you know, having a seat at the table or making a new table or sitting on top of the table, like that's, <laughs> you know, that's, we've been building to that, right? And though I think it's amazing, I, you know, I'm not clapping for what should have been a long time ago. Do you know, in a, in a, right. to a certain extent, like we, have carried the burden for so long. And now, like, just because we get to twirl a little bit, um, I think we st we're still fighting for our positions in, in media, in the movements. You know, it's still certain people in certain offices. And absolutely, and I think you can't take it for granted because like you said, there was a Black is Beautiful movement, you know, in a past generation. And, you know, it went away. So we have to be careful uh, to, cherish what we're bringing to forth and also not take it for granted that someone's going to be okay with it. This is happening. Our presence is in the forefront because we are doing that. We are making that happen. You know, that's Absolutely. not on someone else. I have two favorite, pa well, I have several favorite passages in the book, but one of them speaks exactly to your point. This is from Maxine Waters who says, I had the wonderful experience of living and working with and getting to know some extraordinary people and many of them were African American women leaders in their community. Their names will never be known because they weren't famous, but they did incredible work to transform the lives of people in their neighborhoods. They're not gonna get an NAACP award. Right. They've been doing the work, they've been transformative. My, my other favorite passage, one of them, you talk about hair and I really, you talk about black hair and all of its beauty and all of its texture, its crown, its ability to hold water, to, to, to really literally <laughs> be a crown. <laughs> I love it. Do you wanna talk to that? She it's just so, asked me, so, do I want to talk about black so hair? No, because I do all the time. Because um, it, our hair is a metaphor for how we move through the world, right? It shape shifts. It's resilient. It can hold ideas. It can create new shapes. It can connect us. It's the one thing, whether you're from Dakar or Detroit, th it's, the, it's the thread, right? And, you know, as I said to, I remember when um, Beverly and I were first having conversations, I'm like, our hair is the only hair on the planet that grows up and out, right? Like, it literally makes, uh, see my halo, can't you see it, right? And this, this is iconography in, it, um, that is centuries old for what is divine. Our hair does that on its own. Right, and it has this ability. It's like it's it's black cotton. It's wool. It, that's why it can be woven and shaped and changed, and you know it freaks people out. Like, no, y'all have y'all been to work one day, <laughs> and you can see, you know, Becky look at you like, because yesterday you're, you know, it's like. Because that's how we are. Like, that's how we are. Like, we have to be one way in the boardroom, but then we're going to be another way at church, and then we're going to be another way with our girls, then we're going to be another way at the gym. Like, that's our magic is our complexity. And part of this, this 
society has squeezed us and oppressed us and had its boot on our neck and they didn't know that we were turning into diamonds while they were pressing us down. So that's, so our hair is the metaphor for our complexity and, and it really is, um, and our intersectionality. It can all be traced back to um, our hair. And, and think about every movie where there's a black girl, every play, every moment, like even in, in um, you know, in, <laughs> like when she, like when she took off her wig, that was a moment. <laughs> and threw it, right? Like that, you know, or like when Viola Davis, and you know, when she took off her hair, like uh, for all the black girls, we were, that code, we knew this, oh snap. Like, and there's no other group of people that have that much history, hysteria, pathology, mythology, magic, divinity, and just trippy stuff is in our hair. See, I told you. She got, you got, that passage is ma magical, honestly. Um, Beverly, talk to me a little bit about the organization of the book. You have the shot callers, you have young women in the book, um, you have women in tech. How did you organize the book? What was your principle of organization? Well, as Michaela um, you know, pointed out to me, she says, Bev, you created Black Girls Rock and you do these awards the same way you DJ. You bring in a whole bunch of different genres and generations, you mix it together and you take people on a journey. And so I think I did the same thing with the book, I DJ'd it, if that makes sense. <laughs> and there's an audio version available speaking of that, right? Yes, there is an audio version of the book. I, I should have talked And you about got that. various people to read it? Yes, mm -hmm. we have a few people. Michaela actually um, did hers. I think Terry Williams is in, is in the audience and she also did her own. There are about 20 women who did their own audio, so it's pretty awesome. It's incredibly inspiring. You talked this morning, Bev and I were at an event this morning, and you talked about April Holmes' uh, journey. Would you talk a little bit about that here? It's so moving. Um, yeah, I, um, I was talking about just the the different inspiration that this book offers, right? And so in April, April Holmes is the f fastest paraplegic in the world. And so April is a very inspiring, uh, very inspiring woman. And she talked about her magic and finding her strength through black women, through her mother, through watching what her mother um, had gone through. And so when April, she starts her, her um, Chat her chapter off with, there were um, five words that changed my life. Did you get her leg? And those five words were the words she heard after losing her leg, she was running for an Amtrak train. She was the last person on the train and they decided to take off before, without making any announcement. And somehow she slipped and she slipped under, and she was caught under this train. And as she's sitting there, and she's thinking about her life because she, her life is passing her by, and she's thinking about music, and she's thinking about the things that, the things that kept her alive were the things that she could remember in her mother's strength, in her sister's strength, and in the music. Um, and she talked about just that metaphor she, or, or actually the physical train being on her, um, they, were, they kept trying to lift it and, and get it off her, but it was winter and it was cold, it was slippery, and so the train just kept falling back down. Every time they tried to lift it, it would fall back down. And so she said somehow, she, in her groggy state, they had her drugged up, that she, she woke up enough to say, listen, if this train rolled over me, why don't y'all start the engines up and just back this train up off me? And then she started talking about backing those trains. She was talking about people in life having, you know, not physical trains on them, but mental trains on them, right? And she talks about how we can just tell them to back this train up off you so you can get to where you gotta go. You know what I mean? And it's just, it was so incredible, just the whole story and the way she, she spoke about it, but it was so fascinating. And her strength is unbelievable. Her journey's unbelievable, but I love how she connected it to all of the things that black women go through and what she was able to see. You know, what, it, what she was able to see 
in her mother's strength, what she was able to see in poverty, what, how, how she was already able to overcome in so many different things. And she talks about survival in this way and how you know our story is a bit different because we have had to go through some things. And even if we didn't go through it ourselves, we come from a history where people have gone through it for us. And so, you know, it, it just was so inspiring. So I think that, I think people are going to get um, a lot of this book. And I think, you know, that another story, my cousin, um, and I talk, I don't know if Terry's in here, but I know I, I heard she was here. Um, but my cousin was going through a serious depression. Um, and he's a grown man. And he was just my, my, my cousin, his sister was like, you know, he's just depressed and he's, you know, he's, he's really just, you know, he doesn't, some days he has good days. And so I said, you know, I want to read you something from my book, right, that Terry Williams wrote. And I read it to him, and he just started crying. And he said, thank you. So, Terry, if you're in here, I'm going to, I need you to sign the book for my cousin because um, I told him I would bring it back. But he just started crying. I was like, wow, this is so powerful. All of these stories in this book, from Michaela to Toshi, I think is in here too. Um, all of these women's stories have so much power in them and it talks about not just our collective magic, it talks about our strength, it talks about our triumphs, it talks about our survival, our beauty, our struggles, um, our flyness, our dopeness. It's just so incredible and I'm just, I'm very proud of it. You know, I'm very, very proud of it and I'm very honored that you all allowed me to include you in this thing that I wanted, this, this, album really <laughs> you know that I put together because I, I just think it's going to be impactful um, you know for so many people in so many ways and I think one of the things that I really tried to convey in the book because you know a lot of people say how did you start this how did you start a movement like how did you do this and you know you see this, this time period that we're in where people are talking about you know starting movements every day but I don't believe that you can just start a movement I think that you can answer a call and I think that there has to be work to make this happen. I think that you have to have a passion, a vision, and uh, what did Nancy tell me? She said you have an, um, a passion, mission, and vision. And then you bloom into the position, right? And I think that that's what happened with all of this, with Black Girls Rock and all of this magic that we're seeing now. You know, I think that, you know, this book is going to, like you said, it's going to live on it, it's, it's, it's going to live on forever, and I think it will inspire girls for generations to come. I think it, I'm just really honored um, that you all chose to be a part of this, and I'm honored, especially for Dawn, because she pushed me like I don't think anybody's ever pushed me before. See, <laughs> <Hey>, payback. <laughs> Thank you for that, uh, Bev. And hopefully I will be able to read some of Terry's passage as well. It's very powerful. But before we turn to that, I want to talk about one of your, uh, I think, original inspiration for the book was your own mother. I know so many of us wouldn't be where we are today if it weren't for our mothers, many of whom do the work and don't get recognized. Um, and I know that she was your rock, and you write so beautifully about her. One of the things that's fascinating, you say the most valuable lesson she taught me early on was that all human life traced back to black women. We were the first, we are the prototype, we carry the Eve gene, therefore we hold a divine place in the universe. Talk to me a little bit about that, because that's very powerful. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that's what my mama told me. And when I, you know, when I wrote about my mom and I wrote about my experience, I really wanted to um, start with the why, like why I did this and where it came from and how I found my own magic, right? And I thought about it and it was like, my mom, my mom taught me this. And it's like, you know, I, I, I wrote about how she used what she had around her to empower me. And that was just culture, music, you know, knowledge, um, you know, history. Um, and Every time someone hears me read it or reads it, they're like, oh my God, your mom is so fascinating. She's amazing. I can't wait to meet this woman. And I'm like, you know, that's a regular black mama. <laughs> Not to say that, I, I mean, I love my mom, but what I was trying to convey in this chapter was that we get this passed down, that making something out of nothing is what my mother was able to do. She was able to rely on that village to help raise me. When she didn't have much, she, she created it. You know what I mean? That music thing, she didn't know it was gonna stick like this for me. Like she had no idea, but she was just giving me these little lessons while she was really getting me to clean up, you know, the house. <laughs> and she's giving me all this, and she's telling me all this stuff. And you know, it, it stuck with me. It was, a, it was a thing for me. And so I think that making something out of nothing is something that black women have been able to do for 
ever, you know? And, and that's what I wanted to talk about. But I think that in that particular lesson, you know, I remember, I remember it so well because she was just so adamant about making sure that I understood that our blackness, because me and my mom are two completely different complexions, right? So she wanted to make sure that I understood the, the beauty in our diversity. And so I learned that very early. You know, I learned that very early and it stuck with me and it stuck with me that we had it, you know, and we can claim it, we can claim all of our flavors, you know? And everybody else can't rock like that, you know? <laughs> Owning our magic and rocking our truth, it sounds empowering and it is empowering, but that doesn't mean that um, we don't get down, that we don't uh, fall. And so how, how, what would you tell someone who is struggling, um, how do they dig in and find their black girl magic? What advice do either of you have for that? Um, you know, I want to I say something to this idea that making something out of nothing and that being our heritage, but that, I'm done with that. Like we need our something now, right? Like so imagine if we could make something out of nothing, like if we could make chitlins out of trash, imagine if someone gave us a budget and that's what you're seeing when with these, with, you know, whether it's Mara or Ava or it, it's like give, give us, now it's time to, we, we've proved what we can do with nothing, with oppression, with sexism, patriarchy, all the art, you know, all of it. We still, we don't even, we don't just survive, we thrive and we bring others with us. And that's w with oppression. So imagine if people just got out the way, you know, like, so, so that, that I feel like that's kind of the moment that we're in now is like, n we're not settling for nothing anymore, right? Like, no, we want some stuff, like we yeah. want a deal. But, um, but this idea of when someone, if, if it's really depression, get help. You know, go to, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of a therapist. Like, you know, a lot of people is like, Jesus, take the wheel. And so sometimes Jesus will say, get thee to a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, they, and it works really well together. Like Jesus and the couch work really well together. <laughs> Um, so I'm, I, I feel like, particularly as black women, we deserve to um, get the treatment. Because so much of us have lived through so much trauma with no treatment, and we pass it on um, from, you know, from Jim Crow to, like, so this generation perhaps gets to be the first one not to walk around with that. Absolutely. It's Terry writes, the fact that black women survived the brutality of slavery was and is a testament to the strength and endurance of the human spirit, but the time is long overdue for us to refute this mischaracterization of the black superwoman. And I think that's exactly what you're saying. Absolutely. And, I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and just to clarify, when I say that my mother was making something out of nothing, what I mean is that she found the treasures that were all around us and those things that are so valuable in, in, in the things that we create. And she used those things to empower me. So I, wanted, I, I just wanted to clarify that because it's not to say that we should not get what we deserve, but there is so much treasure also that we have created that we can tap into easily. That's how we keep doing it. That's how we keep showing up, you know, because we tap into it, whether we're rich or whether we're poor, we tap into this thing, you know what I mean? It's like Beyonce, Beyonce ain't starving. But Beyonce keeps showing up. She keeps showing up and taking it to new levels, you know? And that's that magic. That's that making something, creating something new. It's innovation, do you know what I mean? It's connected to something very old in the world. And I think that that is the beauty of our magic. I want to acknowledge that we are not all the same. There's not one black woman, not one kind of black woman. Um, at the same time, you have so many amazing women, 70 women I believe in this book, from Michelle Obama, Beyonce, the Williams sisters, uh, I could go on and on. Uh, was there Angela Davis, Maxine Waters, politicians, tech, finance, every, everything, beauty. Was there one kind of common thread that ran through, one thing that you heard over and over again that is common uh, to this experience? Yeah, I mean, I think that everyone was really tapped into their experience as black women in this skin, in this body. I think it, it affected every single person's um, livelihood, you know, and, and, and they appreciated it. 
it wasn't something that was a burden. It was something that was like, ooh, I'm this. You know what I mean? I got this special thing, and um, and and I and and they were tuned into it. And I think that that, you know, went throughout the the entire the entire book. Michaela, do you want to talk a little bit about the evolution of the notion of what is black and beautiful? It seems like um, it has broadened. Mm -hmm. um, is that? my imagination, or would you say, as someone who has worked in the industry, um, both from a personal level in our own communities and also from a kind of mainstream media consumption perspective, has it changed? Um, yeah, I think it's, it's the same as what I was saying before, that the fact that we now can put more images out into the world uh, without gatekeepers, um, that has really changed things. So working in magazines, in my past that there were so few magazines that had women or editors like us that let certain images out. But now since we have, you know, Instagram, we can see is we can curate our lives. But you know, just personally, you know, I'm a black blonde girl and I'm so light skinned that <laughs> my <laughs> my brother used to say that I was opalescent. And what I realize is that people, there's such a, 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 um, a narrow, mo most people that aren't black have such a narrow vocabulary for blackness. Like they can't, they just see the colors. Like I have the color of hair that mostly white people have, right? Blonde, but it's nappy. Like y'all don't see these, you know, or that, you know, I, I remember the first time I got my nose pierced, this woman goes, oh, you have such an Igbo nose. And I started to cry because nobody located my features before. This is before Ancestry.com. Like, I, you know, I was, I was looking up, what, what is Ebo? You know, um, and so this idea of being so light and, and feeling so black made me really expand um, or want to expand the narratives and also really understanding that I... Like, I know that my proximity to whiteness has gotten me into spaces, right? I know that because I lo look like this, I walked into Condé Nast with a certain kind of, you know, ease, or that I could show up at CNN with a certain kind of ease, because I don't scare you, right? Because you see a color that, rec that you recognize, or you see a hair something that you recognize, <laughs> <laughs> and where it's cool, it's like, ooh, it's exotic. Um, <laughs> But I'm bringing all these black girls with me. Like, it's like that Verizon commercial, you know? Like, so, <laughs> because I can't, I mean, I didn't, choose, I didn't choose how I was gonna express blackness. God chose how I was going to be a black girl in this world, right? And so, the way, and you know, when I'm standing up, you know, there's Kathleen Cleaver, there's, there's Malcolm, there's Angela, there's other light-skinned, you know, revolutionaries that, that also knew that they didn't scare people, so when they got in, they got in. And so we all are playing our positions in this black space. So I do, I do think that it's expanded, particularly, I mean, back to uh, Wakanda, um, <laughs> forever, you know, <laughs> What was, um, what was amazing about that was that all the women were black from a distance. Like there was no need for some ambiguous, you know, like, oh, she could be from Brazil or like, you know, or a love interest that was, and they all had natural hair or bald hair. Um, heads. And the thing is, is what I think a lot of like advertisers or executives don't understand is that if I see someone like Lupita, I identify with her. Like I see that y'all are trying to get a, a black girl. It doesn't necessarily work the other way around. If you get this, you know, light skin, loose hair, curl girl, that Lupita girl may not uh, identify, right? So I think that they don't, that this, this um, comfort with a sort of a, a kind of black girl that you could kind of maybe say she's kind of from somewhere else, right? That, but what Wakanda did, it was just like black, 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 black girls, <laughs> right? Like, and they were fierce and you wanted to be them and no one, no one took their clothes off. Like th the only objectification was the fellas. Like I was just like, can Michael B. Jordan take his shirt off again? You know, so, so and that's a, that's a 
breakthrough. Like whenever you, whenever, if there's a superhero and there's a woman, she's got on like a bikini and shit, right? Like, oh, I'm sorry, there's children. Um, but, but these women had like, uh, at braids and, 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 and make and building things. So I think that that film and other the works that black, if you let black women have some space, again, we will bring others with us, right? Absolutely, absolutely. For the organizers, are we doing Q&A? Are we doing Q&A? You guys have questions? Okay, so why don't I ask a question of Beverly. Um, what's the legacy you're creating and what's the charge to the next generation of women, black women in particular? Ew. Um, I think that the legacy I'm creating, I think I'm just adding to this sisterhood. And I think that's the same charge for the next generation. I think service and sisterhood. I see a mic over there. Where, where are my Brooklyn Museum people at? <laughs> Said no rapper. <laughs> where are my Brooklyn Museum people at? Is that mic live? Is that live? So if you have questions, why don't you line up at either side of the mic? Um, I want you to talk while they're lining up. Talk, talk to me about how you came up with the, the table of contents. How did you decide who was going to be in the book? Was, was there a criteria? And I've asked you this before. I'm going to keep asking until yeah. I find out. Did anyone say no? Now, Dawn, <laughs> that is not a question to be asked in public. I'm kidding. What was the criteria? Was it that they have a legacy? Was it that... Um, they do pay it forward. Was it that they've done something, extra left a kind of extraordinary body I mean, I think everyone in the book has done something extraordinary. Some of them you know, some of them you don't know. They are incredible women. Um, they offer something that inspires us, and I think that that was the criteria. So why don't we start here, and then we'll go over there. And if, yes, keep it one question, if we will. Okay, hi, um, my name's Michelle. I'm 25, I'm from Brooklyn. Uh, Haitian American, and I, you, you spoke about the foot on the back of our necks producing diamonds of pressure and the oppression that created our, resil that, that, that fueled our resiliency. And also, you spoke, Beverly, about how we have treasures that are existent in, already in, our, in the way we are able to create and still show up all the time. Um, what, I'm, what I'm struggling with is knowing that value. I know that value and it's just, how do I respond to the foot that's, that's trying to hold me down? Great question. Well. I mean, I, I think that one, you know, just know that you rock, but two, I think without knowing what that pressure is, um, it's hard for me to, to give you the answer. I, I will say though, that pushing through anything, um, when you come out on that other side, you're amazed. I mean, and we're challenged by so many things in life, right? And so I think that pushing through those challenges um, sometimes it's the real, real hard part, and we go through it, and I mean, it, just as women, we go through it monthly, um, you know? <laughs> I mean, uh, last month, I'm like, oh my God, I'm the worst, what's wrong with me? You know, I was just like having this moment, I'm like, oh, this is what this is, okay? <laughs> you know, but, but I mean, and I'm not trivializing what, what's, what's happening with you. What I'm saying, though, is that, you know, there have been um, lots of challenges that I have faced um, in my life growing up, you know, and you, when you read the book, you'll see I moved a lot, like a lot, a lot. I moved to, with different relatives. I went to different schools like every year, every other year I was the kid that was bullied, I was a kid that was picked on. Um, I didn't have stability. Um, I, it, it made me an extreme introvert. So it could have broken me, you know what I mean? It could have broken me. But what I learned about myself from the process was that I was an independent thinker. 
you know? I learned that I could actually rely on myself, so I became self-sufficient, you know? And, and so these, these, these challenges of not having, not, you know, I, I remember, for example, like, you know, encountering people who had so much more. I'm just like, I don't even know what this is. I don't even know what y'all talking about, you know? Um, and, and, and just feeling ostracized or feeling left out or feeling um, just not, um, not appreciated, feeling like the invisible black girl, feeling like that for a long time in my life. And breaking through and analyzing my life and analyzing those things and coming through the other side of that challenge, I think it's just like you start to see that every challenge is a lesson. You know what I mean? There's a lesson in it. But by no means am I saying that you should suffer through something that is, you know, that is harming you or breaking you down. So I just, I just don't want to comment too much without knowing what it actually is. That's, that feels like that, but I will say that getting to the other side of that challenge is, is, is something that is incredible. I hope that helps. It does, thank I, you. Uh, another common theme that came through this book is also knowing your history, I think has been incredibly helpful for so many because if you know who you are and what you're made of and what your people are made of, you can stand in the gap. Um, and another thing I, that I personally do, and Lovey, I just found a passage. Lovey says, black women are my patrons, and surrounding myself with villages of black women has been my biggest form of self-care. When I'm down, it's a girl's night out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a question? Hi, my name is Danica, and I'm from the Bronx, and I'm 28, and I just want to say, first and foremost, thank you, Beverly, for this book, because like you said, we have never really seen anyone that look like us. We've never had the positive images. It's always been negativity. It's always been if you're not naked or sex sells and things of that sort. And I'm someone that's really trying to come up in this industry. And from the first day seeing your award show, I made it my mission to be a part of your movement and want to be a part of your movement. And my ultimate goal is to hopefully one day work with you and to have a chance to actually host this show. So my question to you today is, what can I do to work for you, with you, for free? Yeah. Just to, listen, listen. I got to seize the opportunity and God said, knock in the door, ask and you shall receive. So I am here. I will do it for free. What do you need me to do? I will be that addition to the team that you need. We're going to talk to you right after this. Thank you. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to send, Thank you. I'm going to send Maya over here to talk mm -hmm. to you and get your information. We're going to do this. And Juan, wait a minute, wait a minute. And, and I want to say this, um, I, I appreciate you. I appreciate you making that offer, right? Because that is how this started. This started, I always tell people, you know, I relate everything back to music, right? So when I heard about how George Clinton, you guys know who George Clinton is, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I heard about how George Clinton started Parliament Funkadelic, right? They said that he would go on tour, and as he would go through these cities, people would want to join the band because they wanted to be down with the funk, right? And so all of a sudden, you've got the Bootsy Collins, and you got Bernie Worrell, and you got all of these people, you got all these incredible musicians who have jumped on this bandwagon, and he's created this super group that got has parlayed into different supergroups, right? And so all of these people came out of this one, this one movement and this one sound, and I think that that is very much how Black Girls Rock started. I called Michaela, I called Joan Morgan, I called, you know, it wasn't, you know, it was in an industry where people weren't willing to speak up about some of the messages and images because a lot of people worked in entertainment. No one wanted to challenge, as we're seeing right now what's happening in, in Hollywood, right? It's been happening in the music industry. You know what I mean? And it was very difficult for us to speak up about it and talk about it and challenge it because there was always someone pushing back. And when I found that I felt I had an answer, I went to other women and asked them to join me. The women who really wanted to support this were the writers who were writing about me. So I just was like, oh, okay, the writers really want to talk about this. And that's how this thing started. So it was people who, and then from there, like I said, there were people who were like, I need to be a part of it. I need to be a part of it. And, and, and honestly, it grew so much that by the time we went to television, this thing was already a huge movement. 
You know what I mean? And so what you're saying, what you're offering is how we started this. And it's how George Clinton started his thing. And it's how anything that people are, are, are building something that is passionate and that has meaning um, and, it, and it is of service to other people, it's how it starts. So I appreciate you making this offer and I thank you. Thank you. Hello, good evening. Um, my name is Janine, and I just want to say thank you to Ms. Beverly and Ms. Michaela for this opportunity. Um, my question to you ladies is, um, I'm first generation everything. I came here with my mother, undocumented, from Jamaica. Um, the first person to graduate high school, college. I own a business. And, um, <laughs> and as you guys were talking about earlier, in penetrating spaces that weren't there before, weren't you weren't you were ignorant to before. Um, I find that struggle. So I went to culinary school and I started a catering company. And um, but my problem is is that I do not have you know the people to speak to. Like Google gives you but so much. And I I've worked. I, there's a restaurant called Per Se. It's like top three in America. I was the only female, only black person in that entire facility. So it wasn't a conversation space for me. So I just wanted to know, how do you move in spaces that's foreign for you, but you know it's your path? Because for me, everyone says, oh my God, I hate cooking and washing dishes. Call me to wash your dishes because <laughs> that is my stress reliever. But it's just so frustrating to you know, learning about business and documentation and LLCs versus S Corp and how do you market and, you know, get get out in those spaces. I mean, yes, I'm here and talk to you and then we can have general conversations, but it's just detail. How did you penetrate in the, I mean, you were in the business, but Black Girls Rock, you've created such a magnitude where it's now a slang between us and culture. And it's just like, how do you go from that mental, I need this and we need this to manifesting it into this it physical, is. tangible thing. Well, I mean, I think you're talking about a couple things. You're talking about growing pains, which we all still go through. And sometimes you just don't see it because it looks so pretty on TV, right? right. But, um, you know, growing pains are still there. All that stuff that you're talking about, we got to do the same thing, right? And even with Black Girls Rock, I think the, the boost that we got was that we finally went to TV. And when we went to TV, um, all of a sudden I had a new issue. The new issue was that we did local mentor programs. Now, all of a sudden, people are like, oh, y'all do mentor programs too? How can I get my child in? And I'm from California. How can I get my child in? And I'm from Alabama. How can I get my child in? And I'm from Hawaii. And I'm like, oh my God, like what? I gotta do something, I gotta do something. And so that's when I decided that I have to scale up and I had to figure out how to do that. And all of that stuff is a process, you know, but, Part of it is I believed in it. I believed in my magic. I believed in, in our girls. I believed in our, our, mag our collective magic. And I believed that it was important for me to provide tools for our girls to help them grow into the, their best self. And all the stuff that I didn't know, like all of that paperwork and stuff, I started having classes for them. The, you know, in the, I was like, you know what, these girls, you know, we got a class in our lead called Wait Till I Get My Money Right. <laughs> Everything goes back to the music. But it's our financial literacy class. And I, and I wanted to do that because I was like, it's important for them to know because these are the things we don't get to know. These are the things that no one's teaching us or telling us. So they have a lot of entrepreneurial classes. These women all come and talk to, to our girls. Lovey comes and talks to our girls. We have a Girls Rock Tech where they're talking technology. And I, I put these things in because these are the things that I struggle with, right? right? And I wanted to make sure that they're, they're growing into their best self. So you're dealing with the part that's the hard part. You know, and it's it didn't happen overnight like what people think it happened overnight because they know Black Girls Rock from 2010. They don't know 20, 20, 2006 to nine. You know what I mean? They don't know it then, and they don't even know the behind the scenes from 2010 on. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of growing pains, and it's it's a part of the process. And the thing is, you gotta fall in love with that process. All of that challenge, you gotta fall in love with that because. The result is just the, the icing, you know what I mean? It's the icing, but it's the what you're doing and what you're creating that's making the difference. I would also say, I, you know, there, there are a couple of really, really dope black women 
who are organizing, who um, are venture capitalists that are investing on other black women. Just get on Google and start searching because we know that black women are the largest group of entrepreneurs, like the, the, the uh, numbers bear that out, but we also know that black women are the last ones to get venture capital and, and infrastructure, and so we know that too. So those two you know, competing truths are, um, are happening, but there are more and more dope black women addressing that. So start to look for your business partner, because if you're missing that, find a black woman that knows how to do that. And there, there are more, there are more than, there's not a lot, but there are more um, now than ever. I would also say, Beverly and I did an event this morning with a chef, and mm -hmm. I, we would be happy to try to put you in touch. Um, uh, yeah. To see, to see if he has years of experience and to see if he would want to share his knowledge. And I would also add, looking back on my younger self and something I might tell my younger self is sometimes we're afraid to even ask. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. ask Thomas, yeah. Thomas Keller from Per Se, mm -hmm. you know, ask him. He's, he might be scary and intimidating, but sometimes I think Lupita calls it the imposter syndrome. Like we're, we're afraid to even acknowledge that we have a right to be in the room. And so that holds us back from even asking. And I find that often people are so eager to help. They are so eager to pass on the torch. They are um, so eager to share what they know that sometimes you just have to have the confidence to ask. And I'd like to say, lastly, that I kind of want you to be my friend because I like people that cook. Yes, <laughs> she does. Yes. <laughs> and I like people who like to wash dishes. <laughs> Another question on the side of the room. Hi, my name is Latavia Brown, and I'm from Queens, and I'm 33 years old, and I'm a young entrepreneur. Uh, one thing I find is a struggle for me is finding the right mentor. And I know as a 33-year-old woman, being an entrepreneur, sometimes we become prideful in finding mentors because we feel like we're too old. But what is the best advice you'll give to a 33-year-old trying to search for a mentor? Oh, oh, me, okay. I, I mean, I still have a mentor, and I'm 53. <laughs> Let me see. Um, but it's all crack. It, it folds, but it doesn't crack. Um, <laughs> so we have to, I'm working on the folds. Um, but I, I think that it's really important um, for me. Are you a mentor to somebody? And it's funny, people come to me and ask me for mentorship. The question the was, are you a mentor? Yes. <laughs> yes? Yes. Okay, so that's, because I think both things, particularly when you're grown, both things are important. Yes. That you're, you are a mentor and that you have a mentor. That's really, you know, kind of reaching back and up is, is important, I feel, my entire career. So people like Beth Ann and Susan, I will sit at their feet, right, and, and then do the work with younger people. Right. But you, you can tell I had a fun one. Well, I also think, like, you know, one of the things that we do with our girls, right, if you don't have a mentor, because sometimes you're, you're trying to find people and they may be busy and they might want to be your mentor, but they might not be able to. So what we do with our girls is we... Um, ask them to create their mastermind alliance. Like who are the people that you would look to, their habits mm -hmm. and their work, and um, who would you want to sit in this boardroom with to discuss your life? And you kind of create this imaginary council mm -hmm. of people um, who you are looking, but you're looking at their work. So if, whether it's Richard Branson from, you know, Virgin, or whether it's Naomi Campbell because you like her walk, or whether it's Beth Ann Hardison because she's so gangster, you know, it's, it's you know, you, you find, you, you can look to people that you don't know too until you find that one that you do know. And then sometimes you're bouncing off of people, like I bounce off my team all the time. And I, and you know, it's funny because sometimes they have to remind me to, to grow into my greater self, you know? It's like sometimes they'll be like, you know, I, there have been times when I've just been so just introverted and they're like, Beverly, like stop. Like you have to come out of this. You know, you have to, you, they have to remind me of what I'm working with because I don't see it sometimes, right? So sometimes you can get mentorship even in your circle, in your circle of friends until you find, you know, the obviously the person that, you know, you can actually ask to be a mentor. Okay. Thank you. Beverly does that for me all the time. She does it for me. She's like, girl, you know, it, it, you know, when you're public and you have to be out and you look like you're on and you got it together and whatever, and there are times when, you know, Beverly 
has consistently, you know, it, it's challenging when your passion and your paycheck are connected, right? Because my passion and my paycheck are connected. And so my tendency is like, I'm gonna do it for the people, or I'm gonna do it for cheap, or I'm gonna do it for free, or fuck it, I'll put some money in it. You know what I mean? And so. <laughs> Hold up. <laughs> Wait, you keep that for yourself. Right. Yeah. So sometimes your mentor is your, is your comrade, is your peer. But I do think it's important to have someone that has, like we believe in our ancestors and the wisdom of our elders, mm -hmm. right? And that I think is something that in America we could probably do better um, at. And black women I think can be the blueprint of that. But again, like Beverly has pulled me out of, you know, stuff a lot. We have a question over here. Hello, um, my name is Gia. I'm 18 years old and um, this year I decided to take a gap year before going off to college because I wanted to really take the time to think about all of the resources that I've had at my disposal. I mean, I've grown up in a house, like I've gone to some of the top schools in New York City. Um, I worked at the Whitney, I've worked in various different museums across New York City and um, when I started to apply for colleges, I realized that I didn't have the options that I actually thought I had, you know, because I got rejected from a lot of the schools that I had aspirations of attending. And it made me realize that I, I realized how passionate I was about, like, becoming educated and learning about this world that I'm living in. And it sort of felt like that moment in Hidden Figures when Katherine Johnson had the door shut on her when when she helped, you know, ha have somebody orbit, you know, Earth. And I have been, I've decided to dedicate the rest of my gap year to sort of giving a lot of my resources back. And I've been looking for mentors to do that. And one of my mentors is actually in the audience right now. But I'm, as I'm getting ready to sort of pull these resources together and start to organize, I would really love to have you all as mentors as well, and I was wondering if that's a possibility. <laughs> People are bold. That's an they example of that's what that's you want. want. <laughs> and speaking of amazing mentors, our special guest is here, Tamika Mallory. Yes. Yes. I love you so much. Wow, we looking like a like boss. <laughs> wow, we are work. so honored to have you here. Uh, you're also in the book. You're everywhere. You know, this woman was one of the organizers of the historic March on Washington, right? The Women's March. We know that one of. And so, if we can just ask you a couple of questions, you brought the black woman's perspective to that march. Talk to us about how, you talked about how it activated your own activism in a way that, the, that your parents had been activists, but this was a spark for you. Can you tell us how your journey kind of started and where you are on your journey now? Well, not the women's march, that didn't spark me. I sparked the women's march. Oh, yes, yes. So, <laughs> but, um, but in terms of my journey, I mean, I guess for most people, well, first of all, hey y'all. Y'all, you, why are you so sexy? Ain't nobody tell me to dress sexy to come here today. <laughs> this is what we do when we got books. Okay, I just need to know. <laughs> she said when you have books. books. Okay, so, um, so you know, my story is, it was pretty much personal uh, impact. Like my parents took me to the movement. When I was a little girl, I thought they were cursing me, like making me go to rallies while everybody else was skating and having a, whatever young people do. They were like, no, we're gonna be over like marching on Eastern Parkway about whatever an issue was. And I was like, yep, I'm cursed. This is pretty much the end of my life. Um, and then, you know, so they, they finally figured out a way to make sure that I was connected to other young people within the movement because I was so miserable about being around old folks all the time talking about policy and all of this stuff. And so they finally found a way to get a younger group of people to come together but even then, I was going because they said I had to be there. So it was like church on Sunday for those people who go to church or at least remember from when you were a child and you had to go to church. But when my son's father was murdered, it became my own movement. He was shot twice, he was beaten for half of a day, 
and he was shot twice and left in a ditch for two weeks before his body was discovered. So by the time he was found, um, he was completely decomposed and we were unable to give him the proper funeral. And so, and that happened almost 17 years ago. It was at that point that, you know, obviously having a baby, being uh, whatever, 17, 18 years old, it was already embarrassing, because you know how the little lady from the block be like, mm -hmm, told you she was too fast, you know? <laughs> and I, already was, I was already dealing with that, dealing with the embarrassment of having a baby young. But then on top of that, the next layer is that your baby daddy is a thug, and he went and got himself killed. Because that's just how we talk, and you know, we just need to keep it real. That's what people say. And so that's what was being said about me, and I was embarrassed. But even though I was living like in a fog, I noticed that there was this trend happening in my ear. People kept calling me saying, oh yeah, you know, so-and-so's baby daddy was killed too. And, and, and women were like, yeah, you know, same thing here, man. I don't know what we are gonna do. And after a while, I started being like, something is not right here. You know, this is too much of this happening. And I'm in some type of club and I need to do more investigation on what this club is all about. And the stories were the same. Parents in, in jail, you know, poverty was an issue, lack of education. You could hear his story in their stories. And so at that point, I realized that it was not me that needed to be embarrassed. It was that America had some answering to do to why this was being allowed to happen to black young men. And that's kind of how it caught fire for me. I realized right then, like, oh, I got it. Like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And so I just really, I became engaged with looking at the movement from all, in all of its forms, that police brutality was a part of the conversation, that you cannot separate police brutality from gun violence that happens in our community. And you will not be able to just say that gun violence is just a bunch of ignorant thugs. There's something else deeper than that happening. And as we pull back those layers, it's a lifelong journey, you know? And I think that that is what I'm on, is a lifelong journey that I'm on with Michaela, who is my mentor and uh, femtor, rather, um, and my crying buddy right here, because I call Beverly and cry all the time, and Tish, and, and uh, Michelle, and others that I see here, we're on a lifelong journey. And that's pretty much, you know, how I got here and where I am today. One of the interesting things in the book, Beverly, uh, there is a chapter of some of the kind of, uh, I guess the second generation of black feminists. Um, Rebecca Walker's in the book, Joan Morgan's in the book, and I'm interested in the perspective that you brought to the Women's March, um, what were those conversations like bringing a black woman's perspective to some of the conversations that were happening uh. before the march? <laughs> oh man, y'all want me to tell business, <laughs> tell business here today. Um, yeah, it's funny, some of those conversations are happening right now. I've been yelling all the way here on the phone because that's a lifelong journey as well, working with white women. Um, so, so the Women's March, as we know, quickly was called by a white woman by the name of Teresa Shook, who I'm really grateful for because she sat down at her computer and was like, Donald Trump became president, I can't deal with this, we need to march. And she sent out an invitation on Facebook to 40 of her friends. And that, when she woke up the next day, there were over 10,000 people who were like, yeah, let's get this going. And so one little person who, didn't, who just wanted to go do something ended up sparking a movement. Um, and you know, the problem was, of course, that she named it the Million Women's March. Mm -hmm. And you know, the problem with white women, which I'm constantly telling them, is that they don't do enough to like, she probably went on, I don't know this to be true, but she could have gone online, was kind of looking for things, and then this came up, and it sounds good. No research, like deep reflection, on what it is that, um, what it means for me to name something that I wasn't involved in, had nothing to do, it didn't help to build, and in fact, my existence sometimes is in direct opposition to what the Million Women's March really meant 20 years ago. Um, you know, didn't, th didn't think about that, named it, and then they got in the crossfires with black Twitter, which you don't wanna be. <laughs> that is the one place in life. Uh-uh, you don't want to be in black. And they were getting torn up. So by the time I met with the women from Women's March, um, it was a bunch of white women. And, and by the way, Bob Bland, who was my partner, is four of us that were national co-chairs, and Bob is one of them. And we beat Bob up so bad, poor Bob. 
And she walked into the meeting with her baby about to come out of her stomach. Like she was wobbling. And I was like, y'all can't be serious. This lady is in charge. Like she's about to have a baby. Um, the first conversation I had with Bob after the initial day when we met was in the hospital. I went to meet her, and she tells the story all the time. She was in, having contractions, and I was going there to tell her that black women would not be silent in the hospital while she was having her baby. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> in the delivery room. Her husband was like, I'm gonna step out for a minute and let y'all talk about See, this. See, man can't even handle like, that. Yeah, cause I was like, yo, I'm not feeling this. Like, and, and Linda and Carmen were like at the door with their bags, they had all their stuff. They were like, we out, we're not dealing with this. We just not gonna be bothered with these people and I was saying wait a minute y'all there's something real big about to happen here I can feel it in my bones mm -hmm. and I don't think that we should get up from this table and not ensure that the messaging coming out of this particular convening represents us and our issues can't let this happen we need to be at the, we can't let white women's agenda be our agenda and there were so many black women on the Facebook page saying that they were going already. I'm like, ah, oh, nah, we got to do this for them because they don't even know who's leading them right, right now. And so I went to meet with her and she said, what do you want me to do? And I said, these four people have to go. And it was one person in particular who's being extremely problematic because her attitude was, wait a minute, you work for me. You know, I just want you to put the stage up and shut up. And we were like, nah, that's not gonna happen. Bob said, they out. And she shut those accounts down and put those people out and said women of color have to be a part of this and there's no better group of women of color than a Muslim, Palestinian Muslim rather, a Mexican American and a black woman. It's no better group. And so that was the beginning. It, we, had to be, we had to challenge them on their stuff. But that hasn't stopped and I just want people, and I appreciate Michaela so much and oh my God, Bev and Michaela were there because there were so many black women telling me, I'm not with it. It was a righteous concern. I didn't argue. If you said you didn't want to be there, I'm like, cool. But when I call you and I'm organizing in all black spaces, I'm expecting you to show up. Don't give me excuses mm -hmm. then, because that's our other problem, but that's another panel another day. Um, <laughs> but I said, you know, you, you, fine, it's a righteous concern. I'll leave you alone. But when I was walking through the crowd and on that stage and that day when I had been through hell, because I want y'all to understand, mm. for us to engage in the Women's March space, it was hell. It was, it was 24 hours sometimes of hell, of tears, of just so much pain that was coming up, just trying to deal with people who were like, police brutality, like what does that have to do with, with women's issues? and having to educate them and take them through the process. And it was very painful. And as I was walking through the crowd that day, Sabrina Fulton, Trayvon's mother, and Jordan Davis's mother, Lucy Macbeth, and Eric Garner's mother, uh, Gwen Carr, and Michaela, and Bev, and Valicia Butterfield, and Angela Yee, and Simone Sanders, and the list goes on, Dominique Sharpton, and Michelle, mm -hmm. they were there. And, I, and, it, and it, 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 it filled up my soul because even if they, did, they were conflicted, they were not gonna allow me to be out there by myself. You know, we owe you uh, so much gratitude. We were talking earlier about how black women have been getting the work done in their communities, but before social media, really weren't getting the recognition. There have been, you, you are on the shoulders of so many other community organizers, but thank God we are now able to kind of show the world who's actually getting the work done. It's, mm -hmm. it's lonely sometimes, it's hard work, but we thank you for your work. We were taking <laughs> mentors. We got gotcha. you, <laughs> and we thank you can for I, being. Can direct. I just give one? Uh, just I want to say thank you to 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 Mika. Just for not just for being in the book, but for the work that you've done. And a lot of you don't know that she's been doing this for a long time, way before you knew her name. And she doesn't just do it when she's fight. She fights against violence against us. Period. She fights for our lives, period. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter, and she will march for all of us. She will fight for justice for all of us in whatever circumstance. And it's one of the things that I love and admire about you so much is that you really care about who we are. And I appreciate you, and I'm glad that you are shining the way you should be. I'm so <laughs> glad you're in my book. Thank you very much.
but, you know, but also, um, I want to say, particularly to the people, the young people, that um, want to be involved and want to work, Tamika does the work. And I think, what were you, 18, 19, when I, when I, when I first met you? Oh, yeah. And we were on a panel together, and I was like, who is this girl? And I'm like, that's one of mine, you know. <laughs> um, but, but I say that to say, because also once you become public or, um, or people can see you, then everybody's like ready to help you. But there's some people, Tamika's one, Beverly's one, when they call you, you say yes because they have, they took the steps and not the elevator, and that they are in the trenches. And when I tell you the work that um, Tamika is doing, not just the work, but the backlash and the, and the um, it's not just the treacherous, crazy white girl tears. Like, that's one thing. But there are people that get on Twitter and threaten her and threaten to, and Linda Sasha, our sister. Like, this is hard work. This is hard spiritual work. And it's lonely, and, and there, the hate that has been unleashed by someone saying that black people's lives are worth fighting for is incredible. You, and, and it's hard to explain. It's, it's hard to understand what these, these little powerful women get. When we watch, I march with them from, the, we march from the NRA this is the first march I've done that I did since the um, Women's March. So understand that this, this little woman's been going against gun violence and gun reform for a long time. Our last march, we went from the NRA to the DOJ, is 18 miles, and these big, crazy-looking babies with guns were there trying to intimidate us. And like, they were on the news lying about her. And I, I saw someone doing a news report lying about Tamika in real time on the news. These are big men with AK-47s, right? So this is what this, this is what revolutionary work is. You know, and so though like you're really cute and you've got on <laughs> red bottoms and <laughs> behind those red bottoms is, it's, it, those, those are blood, you know, like this ain't. <laughs> but, but, like literal blood, like Cardi's cute. But so, so I just want to also acknowledge I got you. my cuteness from Michaela because that was my, no seriously, I was challenged when I was going to become an activist with like, how can I just be me? Mm. I wanted to be the Daisy Duke wearing activist. <laughs> and I was trying to figure out how do I do that and still be respected. And Michaela was like, who you gonna let tell you how you supposed to show up in spaces? Like, do you? So. Yeah. <laughs> we have time for I, one I, more question. We have time for one more question. Um, my name is Amin. I'm born in Nigeria, but I was raised here, studied here, I'm an engineer. The topics, the question I'm going to ask you, um, so you're either going to see me as an antagonist or a call to challenge. What um, she's been talking about is exactly what I would want to ask. So the, the statement, all girls matter, do you see that as antagonist or do you call it, do you see it as a call to action in the process of diversity? Because there are people here that are supporters, stark supporters of your cause. <coughs> So am I, who fit into that category that you mentioned, other or white women, and their supporters, people that have been a part of the civil rights movement. We didn't do it alone. There were women with all colors, all races. So I just want to know when someone says all girls, girls matter, metaphorically, because there are people who are not black here, do you see them as antagonists or a call to look within and say, it's not about changing the movement, but just mm. think about the audience who also sit here and are supportive. And if you call out a race and you say it in a way that could be ostracizing, what do you say to them? Are they antagonists or are you looking within? I would just say that the only time, you were gonna speak no, on okay. it, the only time that um, it is uh, antagonistic mm -hmm is when it's said in response to me saying that I matter. So 
if you want to say all girls matter, you can say that all day and night. And I actually agree with you. Mm -hmm. But if when I say black girls matter, you need to remind me that all girls matter, mm -hmm. then that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I agree exa with um, what Tamika said. I think that, you know, certainly there's been a lot of pushback with Black Girls Rock. Um, and it was always, you know, why white girls rock or all girls rock, you know? And, and we had to say this. We had to, we had to bring this up because we were not being acknowledged. We were not being um, recognized or, or appreciated or, or, or rewarded for our contributions to society. So we had to do this for ourselves. And I think that when any group of people um, celebrates themselves in this way, there isn't so much pushback as it is with black people, right? When black people celebrate themselves in a way, this way, it's all of a sudden, you know, it's this, this crazy, you know, everyone's upset about it. And, and so you gotta pay attention to that too, because we all have very diverse, uh, groups of friends, all of us, you know, we have a lot of people in this audience who are friends who are not black, and they understand and respect what, we are, what we're saying um, with our own movements because they understand that it was a necessity. This is a, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, I always say that, like, we're not cloaking ourselves in vanity here. You know what I mean? It was a necessity, and so that's why we say it. And so be aware, too, you should be aware when you hear that because, you know, maybe you're in an environment where people are telling you, well, you know, you know, we to support your cause and all girls matter, but like, why are they really telling you that? Right. Yeah, that I mean, part. that part. And also, in terms of this room, this pro th that says black girls rock, <laughs> right? So, like, it's there and beautiful, and that's what it said on the website. So, like, <laughs> if you're in this room <laughs> and feeling some kind of way, because we keep saying black, 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 <laughs> and it says black girls rock. That's not antagonistic. That's a little nuts, right? But but well, part of it Nigerian too. Nigerian girls rock. You're not but but that. part of it is part of it is really asking people why do you need to say that, right? And in a world where Eurocentric beauty was the standard for everybody, and you just look at the size of the continent, and that one little island has made everybody organize around that beauty, that, that is the person worth saving. That is the woman whose tears we need to pay attention to. That's the body that we're supposed to protect. And often, you know, in, in, in interfacing with white feminists, it's, almost, it's often they're there to protect whiteness, yeah. right? And so, and I'm not saying this, that some white feminists don't know this too, that often when it's about protection, and equality is often about whiteness, yeah. protection, and equality. So if we, for a moment, for an hour and a half, center black girls, and that, that you know, so just, because when we step out of here, this, this whole world has been organized around white, heterosexual, male, Christian, yeah. Christian success. Yeah. So if, if, if for one moment, we start to center black women, it, it, feels, it, it feels foreign to even black people. So, you know what I mean? Because you haven't been centered. But this, this is that time. You know, it's, look, there's just more of us. You know what I mean? So at a certain point, it won't make sense. We've been out of balance for so long as a world, particularly women are 50% of the population. So for a culture, that cuts out 50% of its power and its wisdom and its magic, they're gonna be off. And then, so, so again, just this notion that also that you have to make white people feel comfortable. Like even a black girl from Nigeria comes up, and says, should we consider the white girls? You know what, I, so even that in itself is a testimony to your like humanity. So. You know what, what was interesting to you, Tamika, about Bob? Bob Bland is probably one of the most fortunate white women I know because her humanity has had to expand in a way that most people of whiteness have never had to do that. They've never been challenged by what it means to be Muslim or what it yeah. means to be Palestinian or Mexican or black. And so she 
is so fortunate to be with you. It's work, it is work. Thank you, you guys have been an amazing audience. I Thank you, Tamika Mallory, for joining us today. Thank you, Beverly Bond, for writing such an exquisite book. Books are for sale. Also, please promote this book on your own social media. Black Girls Rock the Book. Let's get this on the bestseller list, guys. And thank you, Michaela Angela Davis. It's been amazing. Thank you so much.